think we're okay. ready to go. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, tonight is part two of our Managing Stress and Anxiety webinar. Um, and we are uh, from the, we or I'm from the We Center at Work team. Heather is my esteemed guest for the evening. So we are going to speak to you about how to manage stress and anxiety at work. As John mentioned, we did part one in the fall. Um, we had a lot of really good foundational uh, knowledge that we shared. And so we're gonna build on that to kind of talk about some more themes, to recap a few of the things that we spoke about in the fall and just really trying to give you some good perspective and give some good uh, strategy on how to best manage stress and anxiety in the workplace as a person who stutters. Okay, uh, we are your hosts. Um, so I will let Heather introduce herself first. Heather, take it away. Thank you, Carl. My name is Heather. I am a person who, who stutters, have been all my life so far. And I've been a part of the stuttering community for 30 plus years. And uh, I am a co-chapter leader of the National Stuttering Association chapter here in the San Fernando Valley, which is a suburb area of Los Angeles although I originally hail from Chicago, and also a stutter social co-host for a uh, web-based video hangout. I, in my non-stuttering life, I work as a psychotherapist in private practice, work with folks with PTSD, anxiety, and trauma. And I love doing workshops both for and with people that 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 stutter. So I'm really um, thrilled to be back here here tonight with Carl, and I will hand it back to him to introduce himself. Awesome, thank you, Heather. It's always a really fun time when we can can partner up um, and host these things together. So super excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Carl. I am also a person who stutters. Um, I live in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is about an hour north of, of, of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, one thing we're known for, uh, we uh, are the home of Corvettes. And so Corvettes uh, that are produced in the U.S. are produced here in Bowling Green. So get to see a lot of those fun uh, cars on the road. Um, I volunteer with the NSA, the National Stuttering Association, which is the the, the organization that's um, that is hosting uh, this webinar. Um, I serve on our We Stutter at Work team. With we have a few folks here. We've got uh, Annabelle and Chris, um, Frank and John, who are our co leads of our We Stutter at Work program. I think there may be some more folks who have joined, but I can't see them if so. So, hey to the team. Um, we have a lot of really great. Uh, programs and things that we offer that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, in my professional life, um, I work as an associate director of process improvement for a healthcare IT company. So um, I love to problem solve and help people um, kind of work through their issues and get to and get to resolutions. So um, a little bit about me personally as well. So um, without delay, let's let's go ahead and kick off to our next few slides. All right, so as I mentioned, the National Stuttering Association is the organization who is uh, who, who is uh, sponsoring this event. And um, hopefully all of you have heard about us, but we are a nonprofit organization that really is dedicated to bringing uh, not only hope and support and empowerment to people who stutter, those who love them, their families, their friends, um, you know, M, uh, M, uh, M employer, speech language pathologist as well. So um, we do a lot of really, really great work. And some of that is through our We Stutter at Work program, which we're going to talk about a little bit now. So uh, our We Stutter at Work program is a branch of the National Stuttering Association, and really our focus is about helping people who stutter achieve career success. And we have a lot of really great 
resources that we offer. One of those is practice job interviews. So, you know, if you have an upcoming job interview and you want to get some practice, if you haven't, you know, really done interviewing that much or you just want to brush up on your skills, our committee is made up of all, all people who stutter. And so, you know, while we, I don't think anyone on the team now has any direct HR uh, background, we can kind of work with you to, if there's anything in particular that you want to focus on, if it's how to disclose in the, in the, in the job interview, how to best, you know, uh, structure the, the way that you answer questions, um, we can help with that. So that is a really great service that I always try and promote to folks. We also offer these webinars as well. So this one is the first of our spring series. Um, we also have a series in the fall as well. Um, we have career profiles, which is something that I really love. Um, it really is a way to capture all of the cool jobs and careers that people who stutter have. So, you know, really being able to learn about the different fields and industries that, that the folks are in, they talk about, you know, their career journey. And it's a really good way to just gain some perspective on, you know, people's careers and what they've done. So a lot of really great things there. Um, I know we can talk about that for a while. So I'll try and be brief. All right. So anyone who knows me knows that I love a good meme. Um, so I wanted to put one together for our webinar tonight. Um, really, we're going to be going on a, a journey together. <laughs> Heather and I are like your host and your guides, um, but it really is going to be a great session where we'll get a chance to interact through chat. We'll be able to um, have a Q&A at the end, um, but just for the sake of ensuring that we can get through everything on time and you know that we're all having great experience um, as Heather mentioned at the start if you're you know right when you join if you're not speaking if you can please put yourself on mute that cuts down on any background noise we might have um, if you have any questions or comments we ask that you use the chat feature um, we have some folks from our we sitter at work team who are actively managing the chat um, and so they'll be able to answer a question that you have, or if, you know, Heather or I, when we're presenting, if we, you know, have a point or something that, that, that sticks with you and you say, yeah, that's really cool. Or like, I've had that same experience. Feel free to, to use the chat in that way to share with us as well. And also, I um, always want to let people know if you did register for the webinar, which I think most folk, most of you did, um, when the recording is done and we have everything in a good format, then you're going to be alerted when that is available to view online as well. So if there's anything, you know, that we say or that's discussed tonight that you that that really sticks with you and you want to be able to refer back to, you'll be able to do that. So um, we're here for a good time, um, not a not a, a long time, as my mom always says. So I want to make sure that we have the best experience that we can. So, All right, so let's jump into it. So um, one thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the big themes that we discussed in the last webinar, but we're going to bring you some new content this time around as well. So just want to run through a few of the things that's going to be new today. So we're going to talk a little bit about disclosure. Um, if that word is unfamiliar to you, disclosure is pretty much that act of advertising or disclosing the fact that you stutter. And we've done um, a full web webinar on disclosure in the past. I think in each webinar, we probably touch on that theme. And so we could spend an entire you know, day talking about disclosure how to do it, why to do it, why what you may not want to do it, things like that. But just going to touch on a little bit about it as it relates to how to manage that stress and anxiety in the workplace. Advocacy and a 
accommodation. So, you know, um, it's really important to advocate for yourself at work. Um, we have had two previous webinars, both in 2019. Um, one was on um, workplace uh, accommodations and the other was about stuttering and employment law. So we've talked a little bit about how to best advocate for yourself at work and if there's a accommodations as a person who stutter that you would like to, to, to take advantage of, that you would like to seek, then um, we kind of walk through how to do that as well. But we're going to touch a little bit about advocacy and accommodations tonight as well. Reframing. Um, this is something that Heather is going to speak about. And when she, when we've been kind of talking about the, the content that we're, that we're going to present, like this, this topic kind of was a really big aha moment for me. It's such a really great tool and I'm excited for her to share that with us tonight. We're also going to talk about reminders and reassurances. So, you know, these are really powerful principles to consider, you know, when you may be feeling down and you need to kind of check in with yourself or, you know, have those, those reminders to say, hey, like I can do this. Things might be tough today, but like I have done this before and I can do this again, you know, kind of when you might need that reset, that's, um, that's something that's gonna be helpful that we'll discuss. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about setting up systems for success. So, you know, really understanding how we can best position ourselves, um, you know, to be successful, not only at work, but also in our personal lives as well. So, I have done a lot of talking. Heather's gonna take over for a little bit <laughs> and I'm gonna get something to drink and go on meet. So Heather, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Thank you, Carl. I wanna back up one little piece when you were talking about the NSA and all the wonderful things that this We Stutter at Work team has, has produced um, and whether that's the webinars and we will put a link in the chat tonight of all those webinars so that you can go dive into it. Um, whether it's we webinars like, like this one and things from the past, um, mock interviews and all of that. But one thing that I noticed you forgot to mention was the, the upcoming NSA's conference, which is only three months away, actually a little bit less than that now in Newport Beach. And I'm really excited because it's in my backyard. Not quite, but I can I can drive for once. So um, we hope that if you if you are new tonight and you you are going, what is this? That that you will check out we stuttered.org and check out some conference stuff. So enough for the plug and on with the show. So I wanted to do a little recap from our, our part one last fall. And in it, we were talking about anxiety and talking about some of the stress responses that we have. So you know, people tend to think of some, sometimes anxiety as just being this nebulous like thing that just oh, oh overtakes our system. But I wanted to kind of, kind of break it down into three, four types of responses to help you start to notice what's happening and then start to work with tools that, that, that can help you find some sense of, of management. The first one is when we have a stressor, there is a fight, fight response. I think we all can relate to this, that 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 feeling of <gasps> whether it's like resistance or I, I I don't like what was said, and that's sort of pushing through it. We may feel this in relationships. We may also feel this with our own own stuttering. That sort of pushing through, you know, a speech block, but just that sort of that 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 fight response. And most people perhaps have heard of the fight and polite response, which is our next one. And that is that um, what I kind of affectionately call is run away, right? It's that um, this is this is too much and I want to 
get away. So Carl, if you can advance the next for the the flight, flight response. We avoid, we get quiet, we leave. Um, some of you in school may have had to have a sudden trip to the bathroom or may, maybe this at work when you have those big meetings and everyone's going around saying their name. How scary that 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 can be if you don't have some sort sort of plan as as what to do the third response that they have found in recent years is the freeze response and that is if because if you think about it if you can't fight if you can't run away the third response is freeze so that's like i'm gonna get quiet i'm going to get like small, like, I don't know what to do. So that, that, that kind of frozen, fro frozen, we may feel numb. We may disassociate. Dissociation is not a bad word. Dissociation is a survival mechanism. It's safety. Like this is too much. This is overwhelming. So I'm going to go figure out what I'm having for dinner tomorrow, or I'm going to go get a grocery store list, or I'm going to go to my happy place. Um, there are lots of ways of disassociation. It's not a bad thing in, in, in my book. The fourth response, so it's fight and flight and freeze and please, which is if we're feeling stressed, we can't do something, we can't get away, we've been in freeze, we might try to people please. We might try to like you know, agree with whatever's happening. So that people pleasing, we can do to help lower the the stress. So that that is just a little bit about about the um, stress responses that happen with anxiety, as we we talked about in in part part one. Next slide, Carl. So one of the really, really simple and kind of neat little practice, not little, but one of the practice exercises that can be helpful. Um, and let me back up a second. So I come from a very somatic, which means body-based work. I think it's very important to look at our self-talk. How do we talk to ourselves? How do we challenge some of our negative thinking? That is all very important. In fact, I actually learned about that sort of cognitive behavioral work. Think the thoughts, you know, what we do affects how we feel, what we think affects how we feel. I first learned that in speech therapy back, back when I was growing up as I started to challenge those, those thoughts that stuttering was awful. And, and that if I, if I do this, you know, life's going to fall apart. I learned how to challenge some of that, that, that negative thinking. So those are, those are two very important pieces to look at what we're thinking and what we are, what we are doing, what is our, our behavior. But one of the things that talk therapy tends to leave out is the body. So one of the things in that, that last screen with fight, flight, and freeze, and please, you might have seen at the bottom, it said, what are the sensations? When we start noticing what's happening sensation-wise, then we're going to, to a different part of our brain. Because when we're in a high stress, anxious situation, our our main thinking part, this prefrontal cortex, is offline. So we we might be trying to talk ourselves down, but this is not really online because we're in this middle limbic system, which is like a fire alarm that says danger, danger, danger. So one of the ways we can help kind of downshift or downregulate is to is to look at the language of what are what are our senses. So one of the exercises that I do with people is to look at the five senses. So if you're feeling anxiety start to mount, you can name five things that you can see. I see a water bottle. I see glasses. I see a candle. 
I see a curtain. I see a gla glasses case and the fan. I think I just named six, but it, it helps to get us outward of that internal sense of panic, that internal sense of I'm going to die. Not saying we always have that, that, that level, but it, it, it helps shift that, that part of our brain. So five things we can see, four things we can touch. I have paper. I have a stone here. I have a little bit of beeswax. I have a tablecloth. So four textures, getting into that textures and sense, sense, sensing. Three things that I can hear. I can hear a fan. I can hear my own voice and I can hear some birds outside. Two things we can smell. I can smell a um, Burt's Bees that I have right here and I can smell my, my tea here. And then one thing we can taste and I would probably repeat it with um, taste. So that five, four, three, two, one. And these are things we can do at home. We can do these on the bus. We can do these in a meeting at work. Just, just, just a little, a little exercise to help you um, shift, shift, shift your brain. Okay. Next slide. So, I like this, this, this slide. Um, if you were here for part one, you, you heard. We say that fear is, is anxiety with or fear is excitement without the support of breath. <laughs> Paraphrase. When we're riding up a roller coaster, some of us are really excited. And some of us are like, get me off of here, right? If we notice what's happening again with our sensations, they're pretty much the same. Our heart might be beating. Our breath changes, we might be sweating, thoughts going. We so physiologically, body wise, it's about the same. So it's our in t t t t interpretation that then labels it as negative or bad. So so we can go. Am I anxious about doing this web webinar or am I feeling excited? So because because what's happening in here is pretty much the same thing. Okay. N next slide. Just something to think about. <coughs> so for those who are here and, and those I just want to remind you of the power of the pause. Whether it's a cat paw or a dog paw. But um Remember I talked about this midbrain, this limbic system, that's your brain's fire alarm that says like danger, danger, Will Robinson, there is something, something happening. And our front, front brain, our prefrontal cortex is not working. That would be like right here. We have flipped our lid and it's not, we're, we are not able to find um, a sense of, sense of safety because our Oh, amygdala is saying this isn't safe, right? And for some people, that fire alarm is kind of always on. And I think for people that, that stutter, that happens a lot because we're always anticipating the next speaking situation or the phone rings. I think I just dated myself. I'm old because I just said the phone rings. Now the phone vibrates in our pocket, but you know the phone the phone go, goes off, and so what happens? We may go, uh oh, I have to I have to pick this up again. Now most of us have voicemail, but if we have flipped our lead first, first um, Carl, if you did the there, if we if we are we are stuck in this then we need to find ways to um, bring this down. And second line would be that sometimes it's just taking a pause. Sometimes it's taking a breath. Sometimes it's feeling our feet on the ground, finding our seat in a chair. Feel your feet, find your seat. 
I like things that rhyme, can you tell? So feel your feet. If you have shoes on, maybe you scrunch your toes in your shoes, feel what your socks feel like, feel your seat on the chair or on the bed. Are you on, on the chair or are you kind of holding yourself up? And then sometimes it can be looking around for safety or finding a friendly face in the room. Okay. Third one, again, kind of mentioned grounding. There's lots of lots of grounding techniques. I don't usually ask people that sort of common, like, let's take three deep breaths, because for some people, deep breathing can trigger more of a sense of <gasps> anticipation or anxiety. What I ask people to do is to notice their breath. So it's kind of going, going, oh, does my breath go to here? Does my breath go to here? I don't have to change it. I just notice it, right? There's, there's, there's a, there's quite a difference there between changing it because some people <gasps> take big breaths and then they start feeling lightheaded. So I go, no, let's not, let's not, not do that. Let's just no, notice our breath. And then the last one in the power of the pause is maybe where do I feel less tense in my body, right? If I'm, if I'm aware of as the, um, as the meeting goes, you know, down the line, there's three people left, two people left, one person left. I'm, I, I'm, I'm next or, you know, two people away. Instead of just noticing how my gut, gut clenches, I might go, well, where's a little bit more relaxed? Oh, my hands feel a little bit less tense. So just letting my attention and focus go there. And then I can swing back and forth. That gives a little bit more space in our nervous system. Okay, Carl, next slide. And and again, talking about sensations, noticing what's happening inside. Are we hot? Are we cold? Looking at some of the mindfulness practices. Where is my attention going? Where is my awareness going? Our brains tend to go towards what's wrong. Our brains tend to track for pain. It takes a while to build that awareness muscle to go, oh, what's okay? What feels a little calmer? What feels a little bit better, right? Because we're so used to finding tension. We're so used to finding struggle, right? Whether it's with a stutter or really anything, our brains are made to go to those ouchy points. That's a real non-fancy term, but ouchy points. But so looking for what feels better, right? And you can do sitting mindfulness. You could do walking mindfulness. You can be mindful drinking a cup of coffee. It's not about making your mind quiet or blank. It's about paying attention to what's there. And it's kind of like watching a train go by. Those of you um, that that live near trains, it's like watching boxcars go by. And we have a choice whether or not we jump onto that boxcar and ride that thought to the next town, or we just go, oh, hi, critical thought, hi, negative thought, keep on going by. Grounding, again, paying attention to our feet, to our seat, maybe finding where our heels are, finding our spine. How, for the, 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 those of you sitting, can you find your spine right now? You may go, find your spine, what's that? But just noticing how your spine is holding you up or how you've how other things may be holding you up, okay? Again, we talked about pendulation, moving from places of contraction or tension to places of more ease. And then lastly, we looked at resources, looking at external resources, the tree outside, nature, a friendly face versus internal resources. Those who stutter, we have perseverance. We have courage. We don't give up. We keep going, right? We learn to listen to people. We are more aware. So there's a lot of internal resources we can start to look at and external resources as well. Carl, next. 
And now we're I'm going to hand this back back to Carl, who's going to talk about disclosure, and we're going to dive into our next subject. Carl. So, thank you, Heather. Um, I think this is really timely. I feel like I saw someone in the chat uh, mention about starting a new job soon and kind of what is the right opportunity to discuss letting your team or letting your manager know you stutter. So this is really timely. Um, I feel like we talk a lot about disclosure. As I mentioned in the beginning, we have an entire webinar that we've done in the past that's devoted to just disclosure, you know, how to do it, what that disclosure statement looks like when you might do it, you know, who you would do it with. So um, I encourage you, we're going to just spend a little bit of time on it tonight. But if you want more, um, you know, a more robust conversation um, and discussion on it, I encourage you to, to take a look at that webinar. But I just want to make a quick disclosure about disclosure. Um, you know, it's going to look different for different people. Um, you know, and this th th this may be dating myself a little bit, but I, I re really love cars, um, you know, and there, there was this term that I used to hear a lot when people talk about cars, you know, and kind of like how fast your car might go or what the gas mileage your car might be. But that phrase was your mileage may vary. So, you know, I think that it's important for us to understand there's a lot of different factors to consider when it comes to disclosing, right? Like, you know, you may disclose differently in, in a meeting with your with your manager during a one-on-one -on -one than you maybe would during like an all-team meeting where you would decide, hey, I want to talk about it. I want to share some things that I maybe do with the NSA or someone asked me what I did last night. I can say, oh, I went to this webinar where we talked about stuttering. You know, so that disclosure may look different for different people. Um, so I just want to keep that in mind. And too, why is it important? Um, I think disclosure is so important because it allows us the opportunity to be open, to be vulnerable, and to share. And I think that there is a lot of power in being vulnerable and in being open. It helps us to, you know, really be able to develop deeper relationships with people. It helps us to build trust, which Heather is going to speak about in a little bit. Um, when and where we might do it, you know, that kind of goes back to what I had mentioned um, previously, you know, you may determine, you know, depending on the, on the scenario, you know, like how, when and where you might want to disclose. Um, I took the opportunity um, when I joined a, a new team in a previous role um, each, well, I think we had probably three people who were just, just joining our, our organization and we were all on a zoom call and, you know, they had everyone who just joined the team, you know, we had to submit a slide and it kind of was like an about you getting to know you slide. And, you know, so I put some things that I like, you know, I think I, I lived at the beach at the time. So I talked about the fact I like to go to the beach with my dog. And I also put, um, I also put a little blurb about the NSA in there as well. I put our the um, the the logo for the National Stuttering Association, and I and I kind of just talked about it and said, hey, you know, there's there's an organization that I volunteer with, the National Stuttering Association. You know, it's all about um, providing a sense of community to people who stutter, and so in my way that was a way for me to just say, hey, I'm gonna put it out there. It's at this all team meeting. If anyone has any questions about it or if they wanna know more about it, they can you know, reach out to me and discuss. And I'd never done that before. And I was remember being really nervous. And after I presented one of my, one of my teammates sent me a message in chat and she said, Hey, you know, I, I think it's really cool that you shared that. I have a nephew who stutters, and he's pretty young. And you know, I had I, I didn't even know that this existed. So I'll I'll share with I'll sh share this with 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 my sister so that she can look into it as a resource. And so that was a really cool way for me to disclose and also form that deeper relationship with my teammate, which 
you know, I think was a good way for us to establish trust. So that's a little how, bit about disclosure. Yes. How? What are your thoughts on disclosing during a job in, in interview? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I have had a lot of experience with this. Um, I've experienced not disclosing. I've experienced disclosing at the very beginning. I've experienced disclosing in the middle when I felt like, oh my gosh, I am just, things are not going my way. I need to reset. Um, so I've got a lot of experience with it. I would say for my most recent job, the job that I have now, um, at the beginning of the interview, when I was when I was meeting with the hiring manager, who is my who is my now manager, I think I said something like, "Hey, you know, just before we get started, I want you to know I'm a person who stutters, so you might hear some pauses, you might hear some disruption in my speech. Just want to." let you know that before we start. Um, if you do need me to repeat anything, let me know. I'm happy to do it. Um, and to me, that felt comfortable. It was a way to put it out there and just say it in a very matter-of-fact way. I didn't apologize about the fact that I stutter, which I've done previously, and it just felt comfortable to me. Um, I, I will say that, you know, it, it really, there's a lot of factors to consider with disclosure like you know depending on a certain day or if I'm in a particular situation my stuttering may be more severe than say what it is tonight and so that might impact you know how I approach disclosing like the way that I might say it or how I might say it so I think there's kind of going back to that disclosure about disclosure there's a lot of different things to 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 consider on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think as many, I think right now we have about 36 people in the room. I think we have at least 35, 36 different ways of doing it. Um, I I personally have always disclosed during the interview, um, much like much like you said in terms of um, as you as you have heard or as you will hear that I'm a person. Who, who 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 stutters? If there's anything I say today that's unclear, please let me know because clear clear communication is very important to me, or something like that. And then and then then move on. I do think it's important not to um, all all legitize because mm -hmm. there's 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 nothing to um, apologize for. But I do think that when we name it, we tame it. When we name it, we can. Um, it's no longer trying to hide. And I don't know about those here tonight, but whenever I try to hide my my stuttering, that makes it more more difficult. And so um, putting it out there, and then you know even. It can be used as a as a strength, you know. Those interview questions we get about, about tell me, you know, a strength or tell me a difficult situation. Um, there are times we can use use stuttering as a a a, a positive example there too of perseverance of 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 handling something. So I think think it is. Um, different for each person and you know trying out different ways ways of doing it or if you if you don't during the the, the interview you know once you get it get the the job at some point you'll you'll probably want to because most people that I know who, who, who stutter the more they try it try it try to hide it the more anxiety tends to build up I just wanted to, to throw that in. Yeah, yeah. And and I see there's a lot of folks who are mentioning, you know, kind of their own approaches to disclosure in the chat. So I lo love to see that. One thing that you, when when you were just, 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 just sharing, Heather, it made me think of a past webinar that we've done. You know, I know we've put so much attention and focus about interviewing for the job and, you know, why that's important and, you know, what what to consider, how to approach it. But we also have a, webinar that we've done in the past that says that's themed you got the job now what and it kind of goes back to that right Heather like our 
our stuttering doesn't cease to exist when we get past the interview. Like we might disclose in the interview and that's great. But then when you get on the job, you've got to think about, you know, you're going to be meeting new people. You're going to be doing these, you know, intros and, you know, things like that. So how do you, you know, how do you approach your stutter and the, the relationship with it um, when you're on the job? So, you know, just a plug for our webinars because we've done so many. <laughs> we've had, I think, four years of them at this point, almost. So really crazy to think. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and go to self-advocacy and accommodations. And I'm gonna um, be leading the first part of the slide and then Heather is gonna tap in to lead the, the second part. And so um, this is a question that I wanna to post to everyone. Um, and I want you to respond in the chat, but if you disclose or kind of brought up your, 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 your stuttering at work, um, how have you done that within or to your team? I'm just curious to see what are some of the approaches people have taken. Um, maybe how did you bring it up? Um, what did you feel around it? So I'm just curious if folks can um, let, let us know about that. I'm just curious to see what you have to share. The other the other piece too, I'm curious is do you do you let them know that you stutter? Or do you use the term speech impairment? I'm seeing mm -hmm. both and both are okay. Um, I think that speech impairment, I think can be a little bit more vague or they may not, your your, your listener may not be, be sure what that means. So for me, I personally find it helpful to name it as a stutter. But I know, like like Carl said, your mileage may vary, so you have to do what you feel comfortable with. Okay. I, I, I see there's something that Elizabeth put in the chat where she said that she'll she'll put information about the the, the conference on her resume under academic and career uh, conferences, which is really neat. This is not something I've considered. And Heather and I were, were, were speaking a little bit earlier about different ways that you could bring up your, your stuttering like on a resume or on LinkedIn. So that's pretty neat. That hadn't, hadn't been something I considered, but it makes sense. All right, so this next question I have is, how have you brought it up with your manager. Um, and I'm curious to see in the chat um, what folks have done. If you've had a conversation with your, your manager, were you intentional about letting them know, say during the interview, or maybe, you know, once you, you, you started the job, you kind of had to work your way up to saying it and get that courage. I'm curious to see how folks have, have approached that Okay, I see Abby says that she shares during interviews. Derek says he would normally mention it during the first team meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, Frank. Um, Frank shares that he was a, a manager at a, a state agency and he did, did disclose his stuttering to his staff at the very first staff meeting. I'm, I'm really curious about that, Frank. When we when we get to the open discussion uh, portion, I'm curious to learn how your uh, staff reacted when you told them that you stutter. Okay, I oh, see. Can I, mm -hmm. Carol, can I can I throw in that I think disclosing can also mean several things. It can mean openly talking about stuttering. Some people also consider advertising, which may mean, um, again, openly speaking about that we are a person who, who stutters or a stutter, whichever name you're, you're more comfortable with. For some people, doing that pseudo stuttering or, or voluntary stuttering can also be an act of, of, of 
disclosing because it's just putting it out there so that they, people can hear it. Um, and there's 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 a lot of different feelings about that. I thought that was the craziest technique. I I hated that at first, and then it became actually a technique that became very helpful t- to me. That that ad- advertising, but f- mm-hmm. for years I was like, nope, no way, not doing it. Um, and and some people do it, and some people don't like it. It's a, it turns real. So I think there's disclosure can mean different things too. Yeah, Thanks. for sure, for sure. And 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 then you know I I think uh, another point on that, Heather, when you were sharing with advertising your stutter, it doesn't just have to be with us speaking, right? You know, there's other resources that we can have with folks. You know, I've seen there are those um, I've seen that there are those wristbands that the NSA has, you know, um, that, 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 that mentioned something about being a person who stutters. And so, you know, there's pins that you could wear. There's, you know, t-shirts to talk about stuttering. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be you approaching that with a, a, a conversation, you know, so like, say, if you're coming back to work from the annual conference and you got a t-shirt from the conference and you decide that you want to wear it to work you know one of your coworkers may see it and they they ask you hey like your your t-shirt that's pretty cool like what is it about that might be a way that you could you know open up the conversation about you know your about stuttering in a way that might feel more natural than it would be just to say hey i'm going to present it and i'm going to talk about it you know in a team meeting so there's ways to uh, approach it different ways to approach it all right and then we've got um woody and buzz uh i think going on the teammate um and a kind of um ally approach which we're going to talk about a little bit um later so now i'm going to pass it over to heather she's going to share a few points and i'm going to end the slide Carl, that that point you made about about either coming back from a conference with a T-shirt or getting one of the the eye stutter pins or or wristbands, I kind of call that stealth disclosure or ninja ninja disclosure. It's like it's like it's there. If someone sees it, they can ask about it, but we know it's out there and just us having the the confidence to show it where it changes something you know when 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 we get to choose cuz choice and choice gives us gives us power um maybe power is not 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 the right word but it it can help us feel less helpless so mm-hmm. one of the things we wanted to um, bring up when talking about accommodations and and like 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 Frank, I had worked at a at a um, vocational agency as well that was looking at 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 helping people get jobs. That's one of my former lives. And one of the things we would look at is can can this job then that a person's moving into can there be some task or duty some 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 job function that can be some call it jar, job carving some call it job swapping for example um say that the the phone coverage for the office needs to be covered during lunchtime while while ad, admin take a lunch break um I've had 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 to do that it was not my favorite thing, but looking at if there is a is a piece of a job that you could trade, say say one of your coworkers, if they um, took your shift for covering phones, could you take a piece of their job? Like okay, if you cover me from twelve to one doing phones, I will do the mailroom. Um, work this afternoon. So you kind of swap, swap <laughs> job tasks. Um, and it, and it may not happen all, all the, the, the t- t- time, but, but just, just perhaps once in a while. Sometimes job 
tasks or job functions can be sort of swapped in a in a permanent form, but sometimes it can just be, hey, I'll 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 scratch your back if you scratch mine. Which I always thought that was a bit of an odd <laughs> phrase, but I think you get the point. Um, one of the the resources besides the former webinar on a accommodations. You know, vowels are hard some days, folks, is and would would like you to know about the JAN network, the job in accommodation net network. And it's at askjan.org. And they have consultants that you can call, you can text, you can mail, you can chat with that have a huge database. I think it's called SOAR the searchable online accommodation resource where any type of, 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 of disability, you can go in and see what are some of the con concept ideas, what are some of the products. Um, and this goes not only for speech, but it might be if you have a, a learning disability or a physical disability, or a a cog, cognitive disability. It's really a great free free resource with 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 consultants that can recommend um, things. And as well on there, they have um, some 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 legal uh, pieces, legal advice in terms of the the. Uh, uh, well, Americans with with Disabilities Act, but but we wanted to just to put that in there so that you you know where to go to to find out more. And one of the the last last pieces we want, wanted to bring up is as you are becoming a a self advocate at work, is to create allies at work. Now the NSA has a, a really nice whole poster just on this. There are for, former webinars on this. Um, allies, and that's kind of how um, Buzz, and, Buzz and Woody came in here, you know, is how I look at it is, is there at least one person in the room or on my team or in the office who supports me? And when I think back to difficult, difficult work situations, for example, that sort of common scene of, of going to down the row or introducing yourself, at least one person that knows this is hard. That's all I needed sometimes, just that sort of like, you know, that, that there was one person that, that knew I, knew I stuttered. They didn't have to fix it. They didn't have to save me. They didn't have to do anything, but just one person that goes, yeah, this is hard. And that person, I would try to find at least one person in, in the office. But if if not, if it was still new and I was still sussing things out, then I would have a friend, a friend of mine who was usually a person that also stuttered. Um, I, have, I have friends here, some of whom are here, who I've known for 20, 30 years, some of I've known for six months or a year, but at least somebody that you can go, yeah, I have this, this, this and coming up on Friday. And they go, yeah, those, those, those who go around the room meetings are really tough, aren't they? Or now it would be you no know, Zoom call. Um, and just having somebody else that knows what you're going through or maybe if if they don't know that becomes then a way for you to to do a little do a little e education and do a little little self advocacy so i'm going to talk now a little bit about um about having a work ally but the concept of how do we build trust and I like this, uh, this this acronym from the social work researcher and TED Talk um, extraordinaire, Brene Brown. Um, there's, she has this, this, this acronym about building trust called breathing. 
And one of the things that I think is important is this person that I'm gonna share this with, now whether it's about stuttering or something else impersonal, has this person earned my trust to tell my story to? I think we all, especially those of us that have worked on a team or an office, there's some people that you just think, mm, they can't hold my story. Maybe they gossip. Maybe they gossip to you. And you think, hmm, if they're telling me somebody else's secrets, are they going to hold mine? Maybe, maybe not. So can this person hold a secret? I don't mean secret, but how, are they telling me gossip from other people? Do have do they know how to set boundaries? If we're talking about something, does that piece of in, information, does that go elsewhere? Or can that stay between us, say that we're brainstorming something or if I'm if I'm venting about something will that person keep it do they have good boundaries or will they um, bl blur those boundaries and <laughs> take it elsewhere so B is for boundaries the R is for reliability so this means that at, at work, we know our, our limits so that we don't bite off more than we can chew. How many people have done that? You know, taken on too many projects, taken on too much. Um, if we commit to what we um, can and do, then we, or if we, if we commit to more than we can manage, sorry, is what I should have said, then we wind up unable to finish it all or we don't do the type of work we can do. Um, but so so it's important to not overstep what we can do so so that we can we can follow through on our our word. The A stands for um, accountability that we we build trust with others when, they own up to their mistakes when they uh, um, apologize, make amends, and show it. Not just empty words of, oh, I'm sorry, but are they taking steps to not do it again? Um, if we, you know, write off a person right, right away, we don't give them a chance to 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 make things up, um, and when when we make m mistakes, we need to um, hopefully uh, others will let us own up to what we've done, and to then you know make amends so to speak, and then try to make things right. The this one is really important here. And I've kind of, kind of touched on it, the vault. Not the, not the Seinfeld vault, but we can't trust somebody with our personal in, in, in information if they share it without our permission. It's like we need to hold the stories, maybe secrets, but it might, might be stories. It might be workplace things that happen um we need to hold what what other people share with us and not in turn or pass it around um we need to mind our own our own own business instead of sharing uh, uh, other people's business um i stands for in t t t t integrity that it's choosing what's right over what might be easy or or comfortable. That it's uh, as as Brene says, choosing courage over comfort. Um, that also helps us build trust with ourselves. Not only do we 
do what we need to do, but we do what 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 we we'll say we'll do. And G stands for generosity. Oh, sorry, and for non-judgment. Um, this is this is a tricky one. It's about being vulnerable with other people without being judged by them. And that also is true for our our ourselves. How often do we judge ourselves when we're being vulnerable and sharing? Um, we she she writes that we tend to feel better about ourselves when we help someone else, but we tend to think less of ourselves when we ask for help. So we get really judgy about asking for help, but it's okay to give help. So why are we so hard on 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 ourselves when we ask for help? And that to me is a really key key point here. Because asking for support, whether it's about stuttering or whether it's about something else from a manager or a coworker, it's easier for us to help others than it is to say, hey, I didn't quite get what I need to do here. Can I run this by you? Can I rephrase what I heard you say? It's harder to, 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 to ask for help. And yet we then beat ourselves up or we have that critical voice going on. And so we need to remember, whoa, slow down, allowing some non, non-judgment. And then the last one is generosity, that we need to assume good intentions. And if we can assume generous intentions or that that um, if we make a make a mistake that others will let us know but same thing if if a coworker makes a mistake we assume that they meant meant well just as we would want somebody to say that or view us like that so i just wanted to share that those things with boundaries reliability and accountability the vault integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. Carl, next slide. So I want to share with you something that one of my my dear dear teachers, Sid Simon, um, shared many, many year, years ago. And for those of you who have may have been in education, Sid Simon wrote the Values Clarification Handbook many moons ago and I I was at a at a workshop taught by him and he shared with us Mamie Porter's three questions and I've remembered these for a couple of decades now so Mamie Porter was a supervisor of student teachers I think she was either in Florida or Texas, I'm not, 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 not sure, but she would supervise student teachers who would go in and they'd have their lesson plans and they would go and teach the, teach those students. And she would just sit there and she would listen and she would watch and she would just kind of beam, you know, those kind of people. And uh, so when, the, when the student teachers had finished, she would, have them come over and sit down. And the reason we are sharing this with you is that this is a really good way to reframe. Reframe means looking at something in a different way. And remember, I talked about how that there's a negative bias to our brain. Our brains tend to look for what goes wrong. So maybe Porter shifted that. And, I, and I've, I've, I've used these three questions for years. The first question Mamie Porter would ask the student teachers is, what do you like about what you did? And when I first heard that, I was like, whoa, what do you like about what you did? I was so used to looking at what was wrong. Oh, I should have done this. Why did I say that? But what did I like about what I did? It was a total game changer for my brain. What do I like about what I did? Huh. Second question she would ask, is what would you do differently next time? She found that the students could kind of self-evaluate and would generally pick out or be able to name what they needed to 
do differently, where they might have fallen a little short, where they might have needed more something in the lesson plan. So she didn't have to go, you know, you said this wrong and you would have done that and that, 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 that. She didn't have to do that. She said, what would you do differently next time? As the students looked at what they did, they went, oh, well, I would do this and I needed a little bit more of that or less of that. So, but it's a total game changer. Then looking at what did I do wrong and what did I, you know, basically what did I do wrong and I've, and I've messed all this up. B, what would you do differently next time? And this third question I really like too. What, would, what resources, support, or help would you need from me to, to do that? Well, so that can mean a lot, a, lot, a lot of things as well for resources. Now, it might be, you, you might post these with a um, manager, but it also could be what sort of resources do you need? Like, um, this wasn't true for me last night, but two days ago, I, I would have had a better better thing if I would have had a better night's sleep. So perhaps I should have gone gone to bed a little bit or, or, earlier, earlier, earlier. I mean, resources and support can mean, mean lots of things, but looking at what resources support or help, whether that's from a coworker or a ma manager or from your, your wise self, your adult ma manager, that says, well, what, what would you need to do things differently next time? I just wanted to share those three questions with you to, to shift from some of that negative, what Sid used to call red pencil glasses, those, those, those glasses we view the world with, like those red pencils in school that used to criticize and mark things wrong, just looking at what went right, what would you do differently, and what support and resources do you need to do that? Carl? So I'm in Mason to the next slide, but I love that, Heather. And I put something in the chat that kind of reinforces that. Like, I love that it forces our brains to look at things a little bit differently because I think Nakia put in the chat, and I, I definitely know for me, I'm my biggest critic. And I will always say, oh my gosh, people might say, that was great, but I'm going to always look at that one thing that I know that I did wrong. I'm going to beat myself over the head about it. But that focuses us to say, hey, what do we do well? Because I'm sure there's something that we can pick out that we said, hey, I really like that I did this. Or, you know, I'm kind of jumping the gun a, a, a little bit about what I'm going to share, but like kind of reframing it to say, hey, I might not be where I want to be, but I'm better than what I will, than where I was. I think that's so important. Right, right, right. And, and so this first, first reminder is that remembering that our brains may not be telling the truth. It's how, it's how we feel, but remember that our brains look for the bad. They look for what goes wrong. So we may think that, oh my God, I just did the worst job ever, but that may not be true. And because like I said, this, when we're in that heightened state of activation, when we're feeling stressed, our thinking logical brain has gone offline. So it's all gonna feel, stressful it's gonna like we're it's not necessarily a true true picture it feels true absolutely but there's always more perspectives and so we have to to build the muscle build the habit to look for what went right or to look for what sometimes it's not even what went right sometimes it's about like what sucked less excuse my language, what was, what was a little bit better, right? So I'm not talking about what went grand. It's like, oh, I did this better than I did last time. And Carl, you have, you have a few things about that you want to say. 
I'm speaking on mute. I do. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about retrospection and reflection, which I kind of touched on a little bit before. But, you know, I think it's important when we have those periods of time where we might be down on ourselves, you know, to find or force ourselves to find and focus on the good, you know. I think one way to do that is to look at our journey. So a lot of you guys who know me know that I'm super cheesy and I love pop culture references. And one rap lyric that I love is from is from is from Ice Cube when he says life isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think that it's so important to look at our journey, right? You know, and for me, one of the things that I can think of is, you know, if I have a really tough day at work, I might say, wow, today sucked, but I got through it, you know, and I think about in the past where if I knew that I was going to have a day where I had a lot of meetings or I was going to be super stressed out about something, I would have avoided I would have probably tried to find a way to like get out of those meetings. I may have even just called off of work for the day just to try and avoid it. But I can celebrate the fact that I showed up. And for me, that was a win. And I know that I'm going to just keep getting better and keep being able to do these tough things. So it's important to keep that perspective in mind when we may be down on ourselves and having a tough time. Um, Another thing is now is not, not then, this is not that. That's kind of goes back to that same thing, you know, to say, hey, we have gotten through tough things before and possibly something that has ha happened in the past, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna happen again. You know, we've, we've gotten more experience, we've gotten stronger, we've learned a lot more. So, you know, we can just continue to keep moving forward and know that, you know, that's just important just to keep going forward. Um, the last thing is keeping track. And I think, how do you reassure yourself? And something that I'm going to talk about in, in th this last slide is to kind of say, you know, what systems do we have in place that kind of help us to be successful and find success? Um, one thing that I always do is, Anytime I get positive feedback at work, like if I do a task for someone, if someone's like, hey, can you send me this file or can you do this thing for me? And I do it and they respond back and they're like, perfect. This is exactly what I need or I really appreciate you. I have a file um, or I have an archive folder in my email box that I just have for good, for good, feedback and good uh, messages. Anytime I get something like that, I just pop it in that folder. And if there's a day that work is really tough, then I might go back through that folder and I'm like, wow, look at all these awesome things people have had to say about me and to say about how I've been such a good employee or a good teammate. And, you know, and sometimes we really need that reassurance to say like, hey, today might suck, but not every day sucks. <laughs> and it's gonna get better. So I think having that perspective is really important. Now, setting up systems for success. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we really need that would help us out. You know, Heather spoke about a few days ago, you know, she wishes that she would have gotten more sleep and that 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 potentially could have helped. You know, I think it's important to not only think about these things for our professional lives, but also for our personal lives as well, right? We all need sleep. We all need good nu nutrition. For me, um, I found that being able to move around during the day helps me out. So I try and go to the gym in the morning. Um, I got a I got a standing desk for work so that if I'm leading calls or if I'm doing a presentation, I love to have my hands moving around. I talk with my hands a lot and I find that being able to move around freely helps me, you know, and so really understanding, you know, what's going to work best for you. How do you set yourself up for some for success and have, you know, systems processes, as I mentioned, I'm a process improvement guy, you know, how are you going to set yourself up to do well?
Um, I think also important is to have a good social and support uh, network. You'll see a few things uh, listed here, you know, having friends and family. Um, <laughs> Tether talks about, you know, that friend that you can call at, at, at 3 a.m. if you're really going through it, you know, having someone or people in your, in your corner that, you know, if things get tough, you can call and say, hey, I just need to vent. I don't need you to affirm me or to say it's gonna get better or whatever. I just need to like dump some stuff on you. And they just say, okay, cool. You know, that can be so cathartic and so important. So we've got a few other things here as well. You know, I know Heather mentioned it at the beginning um, that she is a host for, she's a host for Stutter Social. You know, it's a great way to, to connect with other people who stutter, to kind of have that environment, speaking to people who get it, right? Who really understand and who you can sh share with and you know are going to really be able to say, yeah, I have been there. I completely get how you feel and it sucks, but it's gonna get better. So having those systems is very important. Um, I think that was our last slide. Um, but I've got some information for you guys. Um, as Heather mentioned at the beginning, we do have our annual conference coming up at the very end of June. Um, so I've got some information on that. But first, we have a our next webinar that John, keep me honest, I think that the date has changed from 420. I think we're doing it on 427 now. Um, but our next webinar is themed around awkward interactions at work. Um, and so encourage you guys to attend that and make plans for that. You should be getting information about that um, coming out pretty soon. And oh. then, mm -hmm. yep, go oh. ahead, Eric. No, I was, okay, I, I, I was just gonna say our, our, our conference, our, our annual conference for the NSA is coming up in June. So it'll be here before we know it. Um, and it's going to be in Newport Beach, California. Encourage um, y'all to register for that um, as well. I know John put in the chat that the date may change to April 27th. So be on the lookout for that. Um, Carl, can you back up one one slide there? There, there was one little piece I wanted to add. Yeah. 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 Um, under that last one, under social and support, it says support for health. And you may be thinking, what does that mean? So I kind of like health to be like a hand, right? It is important that we get enough rest, we get some movement, we have some nutrition, we have some so, so support, we may, so there's there's emotional support, mental support, spiritual support. For some people, medication may be a support. Um, and there is a difference between anxiety that comes from stuttering, from being a person that 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 stutters, and and anxiety and condition. So. Sometimes those feel like the same, but people that stutter do have anxiety that requires more support than some of these other things we have we have talked about. And some people do find medication to be a support tool along with these other things. So I just wanted to mention that health is a many factored thing. And so that there are there are times where with that condition of known as anxiety, that sometimes we do need to check with our doctor and check with our healthcare provider and talk about what might be medication that might be helpful. So not saying that it's true for all people that stutter, but that can be a help um, when learning not just learning to manage, but in helping our our physiology manage. And some people stay on 
medication or some people try different kinds. Some, for some, it's a short period of time and for others, it, it might be longer. But I just wanted to bring, bring that up that if you think that this is something in, in, in your life that is becoming uh, either un, unmanageable or it's becoming too much, then please, please see your healthcare provider um, so that, that, that you can, can get help and, and support with that. So, um, and there are lots of supports here for um, whether it's chapters, conferences, Facebook groups, um, ways to connect here so that you can get a plan that works for you. So now we want to open things up and other questions, comments. Um, Carl, did you have anything from the chat that you wanted to start with? Um, nothing that jumped out to me, but I will stop sharing my screen so that I can finally see everybody's faces. Um, I've been staring at this screen the whole time and haven't really been able to see what anybody looks like. So it'll be able to, it'll be great to be, be able to see folks. So um, I didn't have anything from the chat that jumped out to me, but I guess we have a few minutes to kind of have an open dis discussion. So if there's anybody who wanted to share anything or if you had a, a question, um, feel free to um, raise your hand, I think would be a good way to, you know, keep track of those and we can um, have folks share if you'd like. All right. Frank, I see your hand is raised, so the floor is yours. I I I just went wanted to respond um, to my comment earlier that you made reference to Carl, and that was I used to be a manager of a of a of a state agency, and as as uh, as Heather indicated was a state vocational rehabilitation agency. But I, I want to say the reason why I brought up stuttering and I brought up other characteristics about myself at the first staff meeting that I had when I, when I introduced myself to staff was because I wanted the staff to be open with me. As a manager, <laughs> you really want your staff to come to you as as um, as Heather mentioned with the three points that she made, if the staff has concerns or they need additional resources to do their job, whatever it might be, you want the staff to come to you because if they don't come to you and I had a largish staff, they're going to form little cliques among themselves. It's not going to be good. So, I just I just wanted to really emphasize that one point that a lot of a lot of people in charge really do want you to be open with them and they want to be open with you so they can get the best job from you and and they can get the support uh, from the manager that that they need. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Well said. It's all about finding, getting support, giving support, and being there. Yeah. Good. Other comments? Any any takeaways? Anything that you heard tonight that is new or something that you want to go home with? Put it in your tool bag. Annabelle? Yes. So, so for me, the, so, so, um, so for me, the Mamie Porter three questions, that was really, that was really, insightful to me because, um, um, because, because I'm always thinking about the things 
that I did wrong, what I could do better, but I never really think about the things that I did right. The things, the things that I've improved on. Yeah. So that was really good for me to to see and to hear too. Great, great. Thank you for the for the, the feedback. Appreciate that. And anyone else? Roger. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm. Uh, uh, this is kind of strange because for me, um, I ever since ever since I was seven years old, I was diagnosed with a stutter, and I used to hate myself for it, thinking there was something wrong with me. And it took me years to realize and to get over my own self-limiting beliefs that there was a problem with me, and uh, you know. Uh, and as a result of this, I went through my own personal development journey over the past six, seven years. And I realized like, there's nothing wrong with me, you know, and I mentioned to someone in the, in the chat, like you are amazing and you're only getting better. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, this is only a piece of you. And out of the 10,000 things that you could do every day. Okay. Your speech might restrict it to 9,000. Think about it that way. Like you have so many things that you can offer to people and and one thing I did was that I finally joined Toastmasters and forced myself to speak in front of people all the time. And that forced me to think about how to speak. And then you realize that all that communication is not just about the speaking. I'm using a lot of the techniques right now and like pacing and pausing and trying to take a deep breath in between and, and, and really force myself to be as fluent as I can. You know, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, and, and so uh, for all of you that are kind of like beating yourself up over your speech, it's don't, don't let your own self-belief, like those self-limiting beliefs, you know, drag you down. Like you are amazing. It's, it's up to you to just allow yourself to be accepted. And, uh, like recently after 22 years of cancer science um my boss retired and then my lab got taken away so i got pushed out <laughs> company yeah yeah like after 11 years yeah not wasn't a fun time but i decided i could either complain about it or try to pivot so 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 what i've been doing is um trying to help others and launching an online coaching program and training program. And I can't do that without focusing on myself and becoming more fluent myself. So, um, you know, take on those challenges and anybody out there that, you know, if you're going for an interview, I, I treat it as, um, I treat it as basically this, you know, it, you have to be truthful. Um, they, if you, if you try to hide it from an employer, it's the same as you're hiding some other information or some other disability. You know, you don't need to, um, you know, tell them, I tell them like right at the beginning, hey, uh, I, I just for transparency, um, I have a speech impediment. I'm going to get stuck on my words sometimes. It doesn't bother me. So I hope it doesn't bother you. So let's focus on the content. And as soon as you do that, you get the elephant out of the room and then you focus on what's important. So I hope that helps someone here and and right. and this is the first time i heard about nsa and i'd love to if there's any way we can collaborate or volunteer work together or if you, you know god forbid you want me to come in and speak and or help with a training workshop or something i'd be like more than happy to help out so just reach out anytime thank you roger i think it's it is important to to um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, Carl, take for a second. I just, my train of thought just left the station. Sure, sure. Listen, it, it, it'll, it'll circle back around. Don't worry. Um, well, I know we're almost towards the end of our time together. Um, this has been a really great 
webinar for me, just being able to share um, with Heather, like you offer so much good perspective and I probably feel the same way that, that Annabelle does. I think those three um, questions that we can ask ourselves, that is something that I can for sure use to, to reframe the way that I talk to myself um, and the way that I view myself because I am always gonna be my own worst critic so finding the good, I think for me is really important um, and that's gonna help me to improve. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Um, the train did just circle around and that is that for, for me, it's not about fluency anymore. Um, it's not, it's, it's about how to be an effective com com communicator. It's about how to be real. It's about how, what value do I bring to the workplace? So um, Roger mentioned, you know, being up, up, up front with things, which is, which is some, something that I also do. But I think that for me, I've had to change that focus on fluency to can I say what I need to say? And, and getting more comfortable doing that in the workplace. So um, I, I too, um, really in, in, enjoyed being here tonight. Thank you to, to Carl and thank you, John and Frank and Annabelle and for, for, for this opportunity. Um, and thanks, thanks also to Pam Mertz who had, had had started this as part of the We Stutter at Work program. Um, and so I really in, in, in encourage you tonight to, to, to check out the other resources, both whether it's through the We Stutter at Work webinars, which we've mentioned, um, come to the conference. There's lots of, of We, um, we Stutter Connect or NSA connects that, that there's their zoom connects almost every month there's at least one or two so there are lots of lots of resources um, so that you never have to stutter alone and that's another version of NSA but we don't have that that we never stutter alone so I hope some of this has helped you t tonight um, and 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 enjoy and we will see you again yes thank you uh heather and carl this wasn't this was this was an this was an amazing webinar always love hearing your advice heather and your in your input carl so so thank you so much our next uh webinar as carl had mentioned is going to be on awkward interactions in the workplace so if any of us have had in awkward interactions in the workplace which i'm sure we have what about introducing ourselves or uh, advocating, you know, as a stutter at work and all the ins and outs that go with and and the nuances that go with with being a person who stutters at work and in the workplace. There's a number of awkward interactions that we've all experienced, and we're, and we're going to go over those and how to deal with them in our next uh, webinar at the end of April. So just another little um, insight on that. Uh, but thank you everybody for being here. Thanks again, Heather and Carl. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.